super tired, so thought I'd do a quick post on the molecule that's keeping me awake and powering me through doing some molecular modeling. Caffeine. So caffeine is a purine. Um, so you might remember from your nucleotides, so like your DNA and RNA letters, that they can have their unique um, part is a nucleobase, which can be either a purine or a pyrimidine. And so the purines have these two rings. And if we look at the structure of caffeine, we see that it has these two rings. And it looks kind of similar to the nucleoside adenosine. So a nucleoside remember, is where you have a, um, a nucleobase attached to a pentose sugar, so ribose or deoxyribose. Um, and so in this case, it is um, ribose. So this is like an RNA letter, but it doesn't have the phosphates on it yet. Um, and so if we put phosphates on it, we could get like ATP. Um, and that could be used for energy as well as for using it as a letter. But and additionally, this adenosine can act as a chemical signaler. Um, so it can act um, to help send messages between cells. Um, and so adenis there's different adenosine receptors. Um, so there's a lot of these type of things like in your brain and stuff. And it way simplifying things um, with a lot of these, if adenosine binds, it activates the receptor, it leads to signaling, which um, makes you drowsy. Um, so caffeine, it looks kind of like adenosine in terms of it has that same like purine type part, but caffeine does not have this ribose sugar. It doesn't have the sugar and the sugar is needed to make um, some contacts or at least something because there's other molecules that combine too that don't have a sugar. But anyway, it, the sugar, as we'll see, is going to make some important contacts that are important for helping activate the receptor. And with caffeine, you're not making those contacts. Um, and so it binds a little differently. What it's going to do is it's going to kind of get the get it stuck in an inactive conformation. So a conformation is just like a shape. So the receptor has to undergo a sort of like shape shift um, when the molecule binds. Um, and so if it undergoes the shape shift that activates it, um, then it can kind of, depending on the type of signaler, um, it can then activate, like you, these are often like um, GPCR, so like transmembrane receptors, and then something's going to happen out here, and the shape change is going to correspond, this is going through a membrane, it's going to respond to a change here that's going to activate a pathway. Um, if you have it so that it's not activating, you kind of just like stick it in one place. Now you can't activate it. Um, and if the caffeine is here, then the adenosine can't be here. So we call caffeine an antagonist. So if it activated, so adenosine is activating this, so it's an agonist. Caffeine is inactivating it, so we call it an antagonist. Um, just like you have a protagonist and an antagonist in the story, an antagonist is kind of ruining the day for the receptor or whatever your thing you're talking about, which in this case is the receptor. So caffeine, um, it's like non-selective, so it binds a bunch of different adenosine receptors and um, it binds pretty weakly. So it is, it's a competitive inhibitor. So it's not like stuck permanently in there. It can come in and out. Um, and so the effects of caffeine are gonna wear off and stuff. And adenosine, it's not like you're permanently harming um, these receptors. Caffeine also works in other ways um, that I'm not going to go into. So basically, it's not quite that simple. Um, it can activate different pathways and that sort of thing um, to help promote that perkiness and everything. Um, so we'll look in a minute at how the binding is different for those who uh, like to look at structures. Um, but one other thing is, so you might be wondering something that I always wondered was like, how do you decaffeinate things? Like, so how would I get caffeine out of my coffee? Well, I want to do it personally. Um, but the, when they're making the coffee, um, typically they do the decaffeination. There's a different ways that they could do it. Um, but they do it like early on in the process so that you're not losing like all the good flavor and stuff. Um, but basically because caffeine, caffeine is going to be less pol, So you're going to be able to use different solvents um, in order to selectively remove the caffeine. So let me just 
de-jargon that. Um, so basically all of these sticks and everything, like all the corners, these are all these are all atoms. Um, so like individual carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens. And these um, share these negatively charged subatomic particles called electrons um, in, when they're forming a bond. So where you see one of the sticks, it's, it's, it means that those atoms were, forming, were sharing pairs of electrons. Um, sometimes they don't share fairly. So in a neutral molecule, so these are both neutral molecules that we're looking at, and they have um, they have the equal number of protons, which are positively charged, and and um, electrons, which are negatively charged. So they're neutral overall. But when they're sharing these pairs of electrons, they might not share fairly. This can lead the molecule to have regions that are charged, uh, that are partially charged. So for example, in water, Oxygen is highly what we call electronegative, which means it really hogs the electrons that it's sharing. So it pulls those electrons away from the hydrogens, making the oxygen partly negative, the hydrogen partly positive. When you have um, opposite charges, then they can attract one another. And so these polar things will tend to hang out together. And so if you have water for say, say um, water, because it has that polarity we just talked about, it's really going to want to hang out with other water molecules. And it's, if you're going to stick something else in there, you the water is only going to let things into its network that have like partial charges or full charges to offer them, things that are hydrophilic, things that are like polar or charged. Um, and on, and to contrast this with nonpolar things, um, such um, where you have such as where you have like carbo um, hydrocarbon chains and stuff, where you just have carbon and hydrogen, which share pretty fairly, then the water is not going to let them in their network, and so water won't dissolve them. So if we look at the structure of caffeine, we can see that it has these two rings, and these two rings are aromatic rings. So basically, it means that these electrons are shared all the way around it. Um, and it has these three methyl groups. Um, and so these methyl groups, that's like a CH3, so carbon and hydrogen, remember they share fairly, so this is gonna be nonpolar. So although you have some polar parts of it, that's gonna make it a little bit water soluble, it's not that great in water solubility, but it will dissolve in things that, the things that other things in the coffee um, won't dissolve in. And so you can keep in all the good, uh, stuff you want in your coffee beans at that point, um, but remove the caffeine by doing things like adding a different, like a solvent um, or soaking it um, and putting it, running it through like a carbon, like a charcoal, um, trying to get the caffeine to kind of like lob onto that nonpolar stuff. Um, you can also do things with like supercritical CO2. So basically CO, um, carbon dioxide at this point where it's between a liquid and a gas. And so it can get into like little nooks and crevices, um, kind of glob onto the caffeine um, and remove it that way. So all of this is exploiting differences in solubility between caffeine and all the other stuff that's in the coffee. So we don't make um, caffeine in our bodies. Um, it's made in some plants, um, but our bodies, um, so our bodies don't have like caffeine receptors, but we do have adenosine receptors and the caffeine is similar enough in like its shape and stuff um, and the bonding opportunities that it offers that it can kind of pretend to be adenosine. And this is how you can get these effects on the adenosine receptors. So if you're like me, you're probably wondering, well, how does the caffeine um, not activate the receptor if it's binding in like the same place? So here, um, I'm gonna show you a few papers and I'll post the links to them. Um, but basically, if you look at, so this is showing like the structure of the A2A adenosine receptor. Um, and so you can see that it's membrane bound and it's kind of so that things are going to be binding over here and then they're causing these conformational changes. So basically shape shifts on the inside in the cytoplasmic um, interior of the cell. And so this is like exterior of the cell. So things can kind of like float in and bind um, and then things can happen down here. And so you can have these agonist binds, so things that activate it like adenosine, as well as antagonists, those things that deactivate it like caffeine. And so how do these molecules differ, differ and what do the structures look like? So I really like this um, paper. Um, so this paper solved like structure of them with caffeine. And this paper is kind of like comparing um, a bunch of different ligands. So different binding things and how they influence the um, structure. The basic idea is that these, you kind of have to undergo these different 
shape shifts in order to activate it. And in order to fully activate it, you also need to have like another thing bind. So like this G protein um, binding to fully activate it. When you have an agonist bound like adenosine, look at all these look at all these interactions you're making. So you can see that the sugar part is going to be making a lot of interactions um, because it has those OH groups. It can make like, these interactions, these direct, um, direct like hydrogen bonding and stuff with the, with the protein that's surrounding it. But if we look, but if we look at like the, so these are antagonists, the things that inhibit it. So we see that caffeine, for example, it is forming only, it's, it can't form as many bonds. They actually do this, they have this nice chart. I can find it. They have this nice chart where they show the different things that are interacting with these different agonists or antagonists. So the ones that interact only with the agonists, so the activators are shown in red. And so you can see that there's a lot of these interactions that are happening in H3 and H5, so these two helices. Um, and these H3 and H5 are going to be important in the um, sort of like the conformational changes that are going to happen in order to activate this. Um, and so the idea is that when you have caffeine bound, when you have adenosine bound, you get these, you get these interactions, so H3 and H5, but when you have like but when you have caffeine bound, then you're not getting these interactions. And so then the idea is that you're not like activating it. At least this is my um, interpretation of these papers and I haven't had time to dig too much into them. But anyway, I thought that was really cool. Um, and there's actually a bunch of different types of adenosine receptors and caffeine's pretty nonspecific. Um, when it comes to which ones of those it'll bind. Um, but I think that the main ones must be like A2A, um, but, or AA2A, I don't, um, a, yeah, A2A. Um, but I'm not a neurologist or a neuroscientist or whatever, so I'm not gonna try to dig too deep into that sort of thing, but I thought it was cool to kind of look at the structural binding of these and how they might influence a protein structure and function. And now I am tired. Well, I was tired, now I'm even more tired, but back to work.